the NBA is back, we're enjoying the games, closing in on the playoffs, we're having fun basically. But only 22 teams made it to the bubble, the other 8 weren't good enough this season. Hey guys, Purple Prince here and today we'll take a look at the teams that didn't make the bubble and figure out what to expect next for them. We have to start with the team who had the worst record this season, and that's the Golden State Warriors. It still seems surreal that last year the Warriors could have three-peated, yet now they're in this position as the worst team in basketball. Well, when you take a deeper look at the whole situation, you can start to see why. They lost possibly the best player in the world, Kevin Durant, first to an injury and then in free agency. They knew they most likely won't have one of their splash brothers, Clay Thompson, this season, also because of an injury. They tried to replace all of that production by getting another all-star in D'Angelo Russell, but besides a couple of great moments, it didn't really work out and was never going to work out. The face of the team Steph Curry played in just 5 games before suffering an injury and returned for just one game before the season was suddenly suspended. Draymond Green had his worst season since pretty much his rookie year, wasn't really healthy and shot just 38.9% from the field. The Warriors had to go through all of this and that's not counting a new arena, maybe a time to get accustomed to that and some fatigue from all the long seasons they've had. It was a surprise to see them fall so low, but it was expected with all they've been dealing with. So what's next for them? Well, first of all, everyone should be healthy by the time next season rolls around. They'll have their original core around which the team made the initial splash. That's good. Secondly, with all these injuries, there was an added opportunity for a lot of other players to shine. Players like Eric Pascal, who is under a contract for two more seasons with the Warriors, he really jumped onto the scene. He had a couple of 30 point games and a bunch of 20 plus point games. He could be a great complement to the original trio. Damon Lee, Jordan Poole, both of these players had some shiny moments and what about Andrew Wiggins? His contract isn't great but when he got to the Warriors his efficiency improved and he even started to play some defense. He could do great in here since he wouldn't have expectations and he wouldn't be the team's first scoring option. He would be great as the third option in my opinion. Although, like I said, paying 30 million for the third option is kind of luxury. With all that said, if everyone's healthy, I do expect the Warriors to make the playoffs next year and maybe even make a deep run. They could be the Dark Horse Championship contenders. They have the experience of winning, so it wouldn't surprise me. We go to Minnesota, who was the first team behind the bubble line in the West. Minnesota just seems to get worse and worse every year. Well, for starters, they would need to figure out how to win at home. Just 8 wins and 32 tries at home? That's just pathetic. They had a slightly better record on the road, but obviously not enough to warrant a playoff spot. They have an all-star in Carl Anthony Towns who is a double-double machine, and he's shooting a 3 ball at a high rate. Hopefully he will be healthy next season, and he has a new partner in crime, his good buddy D'Angelo Russell. The Wiggins project wasn't working out in Minnesota, but these two are friends. I expect a deadly offensive pairing from them. Jared Culver had a disappointing rookie season and I'm sure Minnesota thinks he should be better next year as well. They have some nice pieces around. I think they would like to keep Malik Beasley around. He's a free agent but he proved himself well in Minnesota. Jordan McLaughlin might remain as the Timberwolves reserve point guard. They should try to get out of that James Johnson contract though. Juancho Hernan Gomez is another player they could and maybe even should retain. The question is, will there be enough money for everyone? As for some sort of projection, if the chemistry builds quickly between Russell and Towns and they retain Malik Beasley and if Culver improves, they should be able to battle for those last playoff spots. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, there are a lot of ifs, but that is this team right now, a big question mark. Gut feeling, they'll be close but won't make the playoffs in the loaded west. Now let's switch to the east. The worst of the worst this year, the Cleveland Cavaliers. They're not in the best spot, for a team that's well over the cap, they're not even close to playoff contention. They have big money invested in Kevin Love for the foreseeable future. He can be good but not great and not as the number one option that will get you a bunch of wins. They traded for Andre Drummond, they didn't give up much for him and I would expect they'll keep him, but that will come at a certain cost. And Andre, while great at what he does, is not exactly your modern day big who's good at shooting the ball from distance. They could try to trade away Kevin Love, but that will leave them with pretty much nothing on the team and good luck trying to trade away a player who has 3 more seasons and about 90 million left on his contract and carries a lengthy injury history. 
about their guards, the Darius Garland and Colin Sexton pairing could possibly be the long-term answer, but they haven't shown enough to guarantee that. Not that it matters too much since they don't have the cap space, but Cleveland isn't really attractive to free agents as well. The Cavs are stuck. They have some win-now players in Drummond and Love, but around them they have young guards and young players in general who need development. Cleveland will have a high draft pick, which if used correctly could develop into an all-star, but with the Cavs, you never know. Other than a possible Kevin Love trade, which seems to be on the radar every year, this should be a quiet offseason for the Cavs. The projection for next season? About the same as this. They won't be a playoff team, if everything goes exactly perfectly right, they might show some teeth and battle for a spot, but when was the last time everything went exactly perfectly right for the Cavs? LeBron James ain't going back there anytime soon. Next on the list, the Atlanta Hawks. Now, this is a team that was expected to be much better this year. Some injuries, Collins missing 25 games because of the suspension, and here we are, out of the bubble. Atlanta is very high on my list though. I think they have a very bright future. They have some cap space, and while Atlanta has never been the top free agent destination, we know they have some wings and they have enough cash to attract some quality free agents. They have their star in place in Trey Young, and I think they have a very good pairing at the center spot. Clint Capella is a very good center, and Dwayne Dedman is a great backup. John Collins is being overlooked, he's a very good player. Kevin Huerta, and what about the rookies who will be in their second year? Cam Reddish and DeAndre Hunter? They should get better. All of them are under contract and they still have some money to spend. I think they have a great outlook for the future. As long as they stay healthy, don't get into trouble, they should be good. One player I would like for the Hawks to retain is Jeff Teague. The better part of his career has been in Atlanta and he would be a great mentor and backup for Trey Young. Atlanta does need to find some backup for Collins, but otherwise this team looks primed for a playoff spot in 2021. One team looking in the complete opposite direction is the Detroit Pistons. Right now, they don't have a future. They should draft it and do a rebuild. Enough is enough. Blake Griffin makes the Pistons watchable, but he's so injury prone you just can't count on him to be there all the time. Besides him, they have Derrick Rose for one more year. Derrick Rose was great for them this year, but he has his own injury history, and at soon to be 32 years of age, he isn't really the answer to their future either. Detroit is one of those teams which really has question marks in every position. They need to draft a guard and they'll have a high pick, but every other position has flaws as well. Power forward spot would seem to be filled with Blake Griffin in there, but as I said he's been so injury prone and when he was on the court last year, he didn't look like the Blake Griffin of old, he just looked like an old Blake Griffin. If lucky, Detroit should move on from Blake Griffin, get some pieces back, try to trade away Derrick Rose as well, while he has some value, because I don't think he's staying in Detroit after his contract ends next year. Do good in the draft, unload all the players who are taking away your cap space, and just do a full rebuild. They've been trying to avoid it for years, but it's time. You're not winning anything with this group. The projection for next year? Out of the playoffs, definitely. One team that knows what it's like to not be in the playoffs is the New York Knicks. Oh, the mighty Knicks. Seems like they never have a plan in place. When they struck out on big time free agents, they usually sign the second tier free agents to big contracts and handcuff themselves for the future. For now, they at least know who's gonna be coaching all them youngsters next season, Tom Thibodeau. Their biggest acquisition from last year's free agency Julius Randle will likely still be their best player. Most likely, the Knicks will look to arm for free agency 2021, but what happens next year? Their backcourt Frank Nielakin and Dennis Smith have shown some flashes, but that goes arm in arm with inconsistency. And they have an option to extend both of those players before next season, but that seems unlikely. Bobby Portis has a team option for almost 16 million, but that seems a lot for a player of his caliber, which is exactly why the Knicks probably will use that team option. RJ Barrett remains the playmaker of the future and he has shown enough to warrant that spot for now. As with Kevin Knox, who knows, it seems like he's just this big question mark. I don't see a star there, but under the wing of Thibodeau he might as well develop in one. At the end of the day, they'll probably re-sign some veterans and will keep losing a lot next year. Objective prediction? No playoffs for the Knicks once again in 2021. The wind has blown us to Chicago. 
On the positive side, they have Zach Levine, who is capable of being that star player. Larry Markin had a down year, but the team hopes that he will show some progress next season. Wendell Carter Jr. is a good prospect as well. The problem with last season is that a lot of these guys battled with injuries. Five players missed at least 14 games last season, and their opening night starting lineup shared the floor for just 119 minutes in total. That's too little of a time to develop chemistry and any continuity. Especially when it comes to younger players who really need those repetitions. After an injury riddled season Otto Porter had, you can almost bet your house that he will use his 28.5 million player option to stay in Chicago. Who wouldn't take that though? And that means that Chicago won't be big players in free agency. And neither they should be. They have some pieces in place who under the right coaching could develop into something. Additionally, as I said, the shortened season, the injuries, they didn't have enough time together to really show if they can make some noise in the Eastern Conference. Chicago needs to add playmaking guard and some defenders, but I would not rush things and I'd keep this roster together for some more time of development, which I think will be the option Chicago goes for. As for the projection, could be a dark horse candidate to make the playoffs, but don't be sad if they don't. And the final team who barely missed on the bubble was the Charlotte Horns. One word, patience. For so many years Kemba Walker kept them in that playoff contention, but they never were good enough to be a serious playoff contender. Now with Walker gone, they finally seem to have some sort of vision for the future. PJ Washington was a pleasant surprise, so was Devontae Graham. Even Terry Rozier for the first time in his career shot over 40% from the field and the three-point line. Heck, even Malik Monk finally showed up right before the season was suspended. Their biggest cap eater projects to be Nicholas Batum, who has a player option of 27 million for next year, who after averaging just 3.6 points this season would be stupid to not take it. But that contract will be gone after next season and Horns will finally have some needed flexibility. They would need to create a more well-rounded team. They have to improve their defense and a nice star would be by adding a quality defensive center. But is it really worth it to throw a big money contract at someone like Andre Drummond? I don't think so. The Hornets will have a high pick in the draft. They should add some veterans, just make sure none of them eats up your cap space. So most likely next season will be a non-playoff one once again, but in the long run it will be worth it. Draft somebody good, see how your young players develop, and when Nick Batum comes off the books, try to make a big move to prepare for a serious playoff run. Which team do you think has the brightest future and which team is moving absolutely nowhere? Please leave a comment down below. Also, leave a like, share the video to others, become a subscriber of the channel and life will be good. Thanks for watching guys, this was Purple Prince and I'm out.